Welcome to Decades of Horror, the 1980s. All right. We're going to do this the scanner way. I'm going to suck your brain dry. This is episode 221, recorded November 30th, 2022. Suck Can I wait till the show's over? Ew. Gruesome Magazine. <laughs> My name is Jeff Moore, and this podcast is about horror films released between 1980 and 1989. Each episode, my co-host Bill Mulligan, Chris of Cleveland, Chad Hunt, and I will tackle another classic or not-so-classic film from this radical, gory, influential, gruesome decade. Uh, well read. Sweet. Well read. Yes. Uh, Chris of Cleveland. Yeah, well, as my brain, you know, as I start to fumble, uh, get on the struggle bus as as uh, Chad calls it, uh, I'm just going to blame it on Revic sucking my brain. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's a gradual thing. Um, I don't know. Crystal Cleveland is not able to be with us tonight, but we do have Chad Hunt, comic book artist, co-host of Decades of Horror, the classic era, and the 1970s, and the 1980s. And a pretty cool dude. What's up, Chad? I've got such a headache, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I, I feel like my head's going to explode. Yeah. See your, see your veins throbbing. Uh, also with us, last but not least, is Bill Mulligan, writer, director, special effects guru, and all-around nice guy, and co-host of Decades for the 1970s. Bill, how you doing? Doing well. It's uh, This is a fun one. This is this is one that goes way back for me, and yeah. So, looking yeah, forward yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, it is. It is. Uh I just, you know, I don't think we've done a Cronenberg since, uh, what's the twins one? Dead Ringers. Dead Ringers. Yeah, the last Cronenberg we did on the 80s. So anyway, I, I just had the urge. Uh, so, uh, you know, on this podcast, we give a few basic details of the film. We're covering, followed by each of our first impressions and also uh, our super special Hyper sensationalized segment on taglines, and Very then we just kind of take off, take off down the road, and and discuss what comes to mind. Uh, so our topic this episode is scanners. I just love that. I yeah, mean, that's uh, such a Cronenberg still right there. You show me that, and it's like, who do you think directed this movie? I'd say David Cronenberg. Yeah, yeah. Uh, written and directed by David Cronenberg uh, in 1981. Cast includes Michael Ironside, Stephen Lack, Jennifer O'Neill, Patrick McGowan, and Lawrence Dane. Uh, it's filmed in mostly in and around Montreal, Quebec. I think there might have been a little bit in Ontario. Uh, filming dates October 30th through December 23rd, 1979. Released in the U.S. on January 14th, 1981. Uh, the budget was 4.1 million Canadian dollars, which, uh, as best as I can translate, is about three and a half million dollars at the time, U.S. Okay. dollars. Yeah. Uh, domestic box office uh, for U.S. and Canada was f- a little over 14 million. So, did Turned nicely, nice I do believe. Yeah, especially since they Especially. made it to take advantage of some tax write-off that was big in Canada at the time. So. Yes, yes, we got to hurry and do this. Uh, so, uh, the synopsis: A scientist trains a man with an advanced telepathic ability called scanning to stop a dangerous scanner with extraordinary psychic powers from waging war against non-scanners. And that is a decidedly uh, younger looking Michael Ironside. Yeah, look uh, at but, him. But they even uh, they, made him up a little bit, which is good. Looks like they added some extra hair or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't uh, think he ever had that much hair. And and that patch there was to cover up the hole he drilled in his head to let the voices out, if I remember right. As one does. We've all, all yeah. done that at some point or another. Sure. And, and then we put the eye there to, to uh, you know, it's like, isn't it sort of like the animal kingdom camouflage? No one would freak out at the eye anyway. Somewhat. It's like the very, Doctor Strange very, third eye thing. He was a little crazy then, and as he was later. 
a little bit. Just a bit. All right. Well, let's let's uh, move on to uh, taglines with Chad here, uh, and you know, this is our hello. Special. That'll make me laugh to the day I die. Sorry. Yeah. I'm a big Three Stooges fan, so I can't be mad at that one. Yeah. Well, good. Uh, so taglines with Chad. We don't have a lot. What we got? They're pretty good this Two. time. So. There's three, and, and they're There's pretty good three. for once. Yeah. yeah. They're pretty good. All right. The first tagline for scanners is, there are 4 billion people on Earth. 237 are scanners. They have the most terrifying powers ever created, and they're winning. Yeah, I like that. That makes good poster copy right there. Yeah, I've got that it poster. Does. I do. Um, second tagline for scanners is, thoughts can kill. Yeah, so can my mother's. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Wait a minute. Your mother's thoughts can According to her, I can yeah. see what you're doing with this eye in the middle of my face. I knew what you did. Yeah. Okay. The third tagline, 10 seconds, the pain begins. 15 seconds, you can't breathe. 20 seconds, you explode. Uh, yeah. Uh, or or catch fire first. I, right. I, I love it when stuff explodes. Yep. He blew up real good. Blow up real good. Yeah, yeah, real good. Well, and that's been Taglines with Chad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get the first impressions. Um, I picked this movie, so I'm going to go first. And, uh, of course, I was drawn to this movie after the fact. I did not see this in the theater because of the notorious head exploding scene. Uh, plus, I kind of dig. Uh, I was a, uh, I think Cronenberg, uh, Cronenberg did The Fury, right? No. I don't have that mess. No? No, that was uh, Brian De Palma. Oh, that's right. Brian De Palma, <clears throat> the, other, the other guy. All right. So it's kind of drawn to stuff like this. And this, to me, seems like a lot like that in terms of uh, the yeah. abilities or premises. But, um, yeah, the whole idea of mental abilities is interesting to me as a science fiction fan. Uh, so go to this, watch the uh, rent the rent the video, watch the head exploding scene, which comes pretty early, and uh, wow, I mean that that sucker really exploded. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's only like a second, maybe a full second on the screen, but wow, and. Uh, the rest of the movie, you know, there's there's some good acting, maybe another not so good acting, but you could argue maybe it was cast that way, I guess. But uh, um, it's weird watching a movie where there are lengthy scenes of people going <laughs> yeah. at each other, and nothing nothing visible is happening. Now they did their best to make it work. You know, it, it mm-hmm. I like it much better than I did when I saw it forty years ago. Um, cause I can see everything that's going into it and all the effort that they put into those scenes to try to add something to them. Um, but it still is, it, it, you know, if, if you're under the right substances, it would, it may yeah. be laughable. Uh, the, uh, but I enjoyed it and I, I liked how Patrick McGowan is also awesome. I also like, uh, Lawrence Dane and Michael Ironside is just off the wall, you know, and he, you know, he went for it and Mm -hmm. uh, said, they're going to have to tell me to dial it back. Uh, We got some great (laughs) special effects uh, in terms of giant veins and stuff. And we'll talk about all that later. And some, I I don't know. I, I just enjoyed it. Cronenberg's always interesting, I think. Um. So let's uh, go to uh, Bill Mulligan here. Uh, what were your impressions of Scanners? Well, I saw this as soon as I could. I think it was the cover of Fangoria that kind of uh, they they showed the explosion, though they cleaned it up a little. I guess they, they cut it at a spot where it wasn't quite so wet. 
And uh, watching this in the theater, I mean, the audience just flipped out at the head exploding scene, which is such a dom is such a great scene. It, my impression is always that it's the very beginning of the movie, and it's not. There's actually a little bit to get there. Um, I love this movie, but watching it now, I felt as I did then, it's got one huge flaw, and I hate to pick on anyone because I'm not sure how much of a <laughs> fault it is, but Stephen Lack, the, the protagonist, either gives a dreadful performance or he gives exactly the performance that Cronenberg wanted. And I can see the argument that here's a person who has no memory, has no past. How much of a personality would he have? So this flat affect, this this the line readings and everything are maybe exactly what they were going for. The problem is you're in a movie with, you know, McGowan, who is just so good at what he does. Watching it now, of course, all I could think of was Edward the First from Braveheart. His voice is just like, I, I could listen to him recite the phone book. And Ironside knocks it out of the park. He's so much better a character than our hero. You're never rooting for him, but you definitely want to see him on the screen because he's so good at what he does there. So that is a big problem. Um, the lead actress is introduced very late into the movie and doesn't have all that great uh, an impact in it. So it's an odd film. It's an odd Cronenberg film back when Cronenberg was really, really odd. His movies are just strange, those early ones especially. And then you find out, well, they were shooting without a script. This movie has so many cool ideas, though. Watching it at the time, I was huge into X-Men really into X-Men. And this was like the closest thing to an X-Men movie I could find, you know, mutants being persecuted, some are for good, some are for evil. And yeah, it was, it was, there's so many cool things they could do with it. It's got a lot of ideas that, that they don't have time to explore the scene where they realize they're being scanned by an unborn child. A future scanner mm. is like, Whoa, where are we going with that? Well, we're not going anywhere. It's just introduced and dropped. Um, but, all the elements were there for a real sequel too, but uh, and there have been sequels, but they weren't. They had nothing to do with Cronenberg. So, mm. oh come on, Scanner Cop! I gotta watch Scanner. Cop. I don't think I've ever <laughs> actually seen it. Um, hey, this I don't you're, know. You're, you'll this. be fine not seeing it. No, no. Has, <laughs> now, am I? Have they ever made a Scanners TV show? I don't think hmm. so. It it seems like a no brainer. Um, I don't know. And, and, you know, so so I love this movie a lot. It's, it's also, from a special effects standpoint, pretty influential because this was one of the first, if not the first movie, to really use, like, the bladder effects when the veins are crawling across mm -hmm. and they still look good to this day. The uh, the head blow up scene, of course, is just absolutely iconic. I can't believe they got away with it and didn't get an X rating. I, I still It still kind of boggles my mind because they were pretty quick on the cuts back then. So I think it still holds up, but it is a strange movie from a time before Cronenberg kind of reined it back. I mean, he's still a strange guy, but you know, his future, his later movies like uh, dead zone, which is still my favorite are much more, this is an indie film, very much an indie film, but an indie film by someone who's got a lot of ideas and a lot of creativity, maybe more than the budget would allow him to do. And there's just something about those early Cronenberg movies uh, that came from within this one. Um, what was the one with Marilyn Chambers where she had the parasitic? Uh, rabid. rabid. Rabid, yeah. I mean, those movies are so much better than they had any reason to be. They're just trying, listen, we got to make a movie to make some money because we got a crazy tax write-off and everything. Here's some money, make a movie. And they didn't care what movies were, but Cronenberg did care. I think that's mm. one reason why I've always liked his stuff. He could have just hacked out something pretty simple, but instead we get things with real ideas and real imagination. So still holds up. I was real happy watching it again. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for picking it. Thank you. Uh, Chad, how about you? Um, I first saw this uh, snuck into the theater because Ooh. I was too young to see it. Yeah. But I had it's a buddy that worked at the theater and he would always let us in to watch R rated movies. So, um, me and a couple of my friends got inside and we were watching this and uh, we thought the same thing like Bill did. I was like, this is like a superhero 
this is like a superhero movie. Um, and then the exploding head came. Everybody in the theater freaked out. Everybody, I'll never forget it. Old ladies were passing out in the in the, in the aisle. <laughs> Popcorn was flying everywhere. It was just an awesome, awesome experience. And, and um, I have loved this movie ever since, despite despite some of the the flaws that probably couldn't be helped uh, due to the budget and script issues and stuff like that. Uh, but this um, movie is one of my favorites. Uh, Michael Ironside, uh, who can go wrong with Michael Ironside? I mean, he, he was awesome in this, um, playing the kind of kind of um, a-hole that he, he's always played, that he's excellent at. Uh, McGowan was, was there. Um, it was a blast seeing him, you know, in there with the weird... Um, the weird hairdo with the curls up the side and all, and all it was just uh that was it was just awesome so yeah this is one of my favorites and it does seem like every time i watch it i enjoy it more uh i think bill said it or, or jeff said it once um because you're you're still picking up stuff you you're seeing and as you get older you you see these ideas coming through and and you're always like um if only he had a a big budget from a major studio um he could have made um, some of these ideas that he had for this movie uh come to life a little better i mean um you couldn't ask more from the special effects in this but as far as bringing those ideas other ideas forward i think it would have he would have done a lot better with a bigger budget uh, um uh yeah so yeah this is still one of my favorites i love it to this day and uh, I'm glad I got a chance to watch it again. So cool, cool. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, interesting. I'm looking forward to talking about this. Uh, well, let's take a look at the uh, uh, some of the stuff we got. We'll start off with the posters, which are pretty. You know, there's two that I think everybody's seen. This is the one. That is the one. Mm -hmm. I have that. Um, I've got to find where I have that tucked away because that needs to go up on my wall. It's great. Why don't they make posters like this anymore? Painted, mm -hmm. make you want to just take my money. Let's get it. what is going on here. Yeah. And also, it doesn't lie because that is a pretty, pretty accurate portrayal of mm -hmm. uh, of what you're going for. It doesn't give anything away. Mm -hmm. Great poster. Uh, and then we have uh, sort of the second <laughs> one. So that nah, one looks I've like never a science fiction. That, yeah, that's a science fiction one. That's for that's for the so we don't scare the children, I guess, with uh, the other one. There's a there's a really great one on the cover of the uh, Criterion Blu-ray. That's that's just freakier and heck. I'll mm. I don't know if I have it or not. So oh. uh, I might think about it here in a minute. But there's a lot of good um, fan art, art out there too, of course. Mm -hmm. Mostly variations of. But it's also. Boy. It's also supposed to be Revic, um, but it's it's done in kind of a patchwork hmm. way. Oh, I think I know the one you're talking about. That is cool. All right, so let's move on. Take a look at. I mean, this is like this guy is the star. Uh, oh yeah, he's the man. You know, and, and okay, this is not someone with movie star good looks. But when he shows up in a in a project, you know, mm -hmm. you've probably got a good villain. He sometimes plays against type, but um, look at that grin in the middle there. He's you know, yeah. someone's pointing a gun at his head, and he's smiling because he knows he's not the one that's going to be eating that bullet. Oh, you uh, you cannot forget the faces he makes either when he's yeah doing this yeah. scanning stuff. He just is like. <clears throat> You're know right. It could, be, it could be silly if someone else were doing it, but when he's doing it, you almost you almost get the feeling like he's enjoying the sensation of sliding into someone else's brain and just sort of it, you know, it's it's almost erotic. It's it's a strange thing, but yeah, he's he put more thought into this than anyone else did. You know, and everyone else is just sort of grimacing and grunting and blah blah blah. But he's mm. yeah, he's got a good look. And he, and he was a great villain in 
total recall. I think that's yeah. the top picture. I mean, he, he's legit taking on Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you think well, Arnold might be in trouble here. And then he played a fairly heroic character, a hard-ass, but a heroic character in Starship Troopers. Yeah, yeah. Goes out like a boss. Um, he's just good and stuff. He's great. I heard a rumor that he was up for the role of the Joker in Tim Burton's Batman. And um, that would have been, ooh, that would have been interesting. I, I can see, yeah. I mean, they had to go with Nicholson because as crazy mm -hmm. as it is to believe now, a lot of people thought that was a dicey mm. project that had very little chance of succeeding. Mm. So it probably wouldn't have even been made without Nicholson. In retrospect, he would have been a great Joker. He would have been yeah. a scary Joker. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. Well, we I had, had half, half the grin we, already. Yeah. Yeah. We had, uh, we talked a little bit before the, uh, before we went on the air that he was actually paid a fairly small amount for this. <laughs> Uh, and I forget what it was. Was it, it was like five thousand dollars, which is yeah. That's that's what I, I was hope thinking. That's a typo. And that all he was supposed to play was this this guy in these few video shots, mm -hmm. uh, and then boom, he becomes literally the the star. Yeah. Um, anyway, they couldn't they couldn't uh, turn him down. I guess that's an impressive. I hope they tossed a few more dollars his way when it went from a bit role to a uh, featured role. Yeah, hope so too. Although this was one of his early roles and, you know, some actors when they're in that stage, it's like, oh, I'll work for Peanuts. And you probably shouldn't say that out loud. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Um, well, so he's, He's great, not only as sort of the mean, diabolical uh, conspiracy guy that's running the show, but also when he does his scanning stuff, he just is going uh, over the top with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so his, his as we find out late in the film, spoilers, everybody, uh, this is Decades of Horror, yeah. uh, Stephen Lack plays his brother, uh, Cameron and uh, Ironside's name is Daryl Revick. So Cameron Vale and Daryl Revick. You can always count brothers. crazy names in a Cronenberg movie. And their yeah. father is Patrick McGowan, Dr. Dr. Ruth, Ruth Westheimer. Yeah. Dr. Ruth. Zex and Zex and Zex. I don't know if that's when Dr. Ruth was popular or not. It seems like uh, it, it was before her time. That's when she was a young 80 year old or so. Uh, yeah. But these are these are cool. I love that scene with uh, uh, the bottom shot that you have yeah. there when they're when they're having the face off kind of, and then you know they do that whole special effects thing with the veins in their heads and the mm -hmm. bladders, and uh, he starts ripping at them, and then the, uh, that's a really that's good stuff. Yeah, it, it is good like stuff. That, flesh that under his face. There, and, yeah, it's a special kind of fire gel, and and. The secret to making an atomic bomb is not as secret as the secret for making that fire gel. Thank God, because I would have made it by the ton and probably burned my ass on some Super 8 project if I'd been given a hold of that stuff. Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember where I read this. If this was for this movie or not, you tell me. I hope one of you guys will recognize it. But one of the, some special effects guy whose key development, he was a chemical engineer. And he created this, the gel that's fireproof so that you could start them on fire and yeah. not feel the heat on your hand, you know. That's, for a little while. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't count on it. it that's going to bug me now that I, I brought that up and I can't remember just exactly. For any, for any amateur filmmakers out there, please listen to the words that are coming out of my lips. Do not dick around with fire or uh, make bullet squibs out of firecrackers. Okay, those are the two ideas that will up, that will come to you as they do to all of us. Push them away. Don't do anything. <laughs> Just trust Don't me. Trust me on this. So Write this me, is, and I'll tell you another way to do it, other than that way. Considering that this is written kind of on the fly because of this whole tax shelter or tax, whatever the heck was going on there in Canada, that if they finished it by. Uh, the end of the year they could save a whole bunch of money 
um, it was pretty much written on the fly, and it's a yeah. fairly complicated, very complicated plot. Uh, you know, the one guy is he's hired to be the spy for Doctor Ruth, but yet he's really the other guy's brother, and the doctor invented ephemeral and it actually not only does it control the scanners it created the scanners we find out like halfway through the movie he -hmm. gave it to his own wife uh and now they're giving it out to uh revic is giving it out to uh uh, obstetricians to Mm -hmm. inject his their pregnant patients to create new scanners yeah it's like it starts right. out one way and it twists, right. but it stays. It right. stays who's the good guy? Uh, who's true. the bad guy? And, right. Yeah, it stays yeah. true, though. I mean, there's no. I don't see flaws in that. And you know, you would think with all those twists in there, right? And doing that on the fly, there'd be a, there'd be something that doesn't make sense. Or I mean, I think if he it, had right. time to hammer out the script a little more, you know, there's some things like it's it's unusual to introduce a main character halfway through the movie, but that's what they do with Jennifer O'Neill. They you know they probably could have come up with something a little more cohesive. But it's it's kind of a mystery even to the the people in the film, so it's no strangeness to us. She didn't have much of a career. She was a very popular uh, makeup model, and she's in this one. This is um, Lucio Fulci's The Psychic, which oh, is her okay. other, yeah her other big uh, genre pick. And we'll probably end up doing The Psychic. Oh, you mean you're not going to count Poltergeist: The Legacy? Oh, uh, and, and also she was in the reincarnation <laughs> of Peter Proud. Um, well, there's another one. There's a, uh, uh, I, I assume it's a Jalo just from the title. Uh, and I got to find it something about the murder to the tune of the seven black notes. Well, that does sound Giallo. Yeah. And it's, that's a Fulci. Oh, that's the psychic. That's just another title for the oh, just, Sorry. Oh, they just, yeah. Ah, Sorry. sucker. You probably rented the same movie three times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which has a great poster with a skull with a woman lying yeah. coming out of the eyes. Uh, right, right. I don't think that's actually. Well, she got bad. she got started. I mean, she was a big. Uh, I, I was actually kind of surprised looking at her credit because my impression was she just sort of popped on the scene in summer of forty two. Right. Um, yes, that was her big one. And uh, she was actually in. Uh, she was in for love of Ivy. She was, okay. had a part in Rio Lobo, the John Wayne movie, wow. Wow. Uh, which I just don't remember at all. I'm going to have to go look at that again. And then, boom, Summer of 42. And then she gets she starts getting put in stuff where she's like, you know, supposed to act. In Summer of 42, she, doesn't, she just kind of looks wistful looking out the window. Right, the right, yeah. Has a love scene with the kid. And uh, she was, she was uh, I don't know, I read something where she was, she was taken... She wasn't real confident about that. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. Pretty nervous about going into these true acting roles with heavy duty. Uh, Understandable. Um, so and, anyway. and I heard that she did not get along with Patrick McGowan. Now, I could see if you're a young, if you're an actress, not really confident, and you're with this guy who's a Shakespearean actor and just, you know, that would be intimidating. But I've also heard that McGowan, who I love, could be difficult. And that's interesting yeah. that Cro- Cronenberg often worked with people that, you know, if not difficult, quirky. I mean, you know, um, the brood has Oliver Reed. Holy mm-hmm. crap. I mean, Oliver Reed, other than uh, Klaus <laughs> Pinsky, I can't imagine anyone <laughs> who personifies difficult more. Um, but he, he reigns them in and gets interesting performances out of them. Um, well, yeah, I, maybe I he, think maybe he, does, maybe he doesn't rein him in. Maybe he just lets him loose. But either way, he gets good performances out of it. Well, I, I thought he's great in this because he, he does this. Like, he's this, he's this guy that thinks he is and probably is the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. And, but yet there are times where he's just, he's just slouching in the chair. You know, he's just so, it, it's just odd, I thought. Right. But, well, I think we later find out he's something. got a lot of guilt because you know he experimented on his own kids, yeah, and uh, look how they turned out. Well, in that picture on the top, too, when uh, Keller or uh, Lawrence Dane was gonna execute him, he's literally like going through the psychic, he's just kind of babbling, arguing yeah. with himself, you know. Uh, 
but he's he's so good. He's got this great uh, tone. Um, I, I just I and, love and guys just like that, just such know. a look. I mean, I love that picture in the middle from Braveheart. That this is my ultimate nightmare is to you know be working for someone or you know if that were your dad or whatever that look that look of absolute <laughs> you're in trouble now where, yeah you are you are so death would be a welcome respite from what was probably going to happen um yeah he was so good in this and that voice yeah man he's great so well when did the uh and that one oh, on the that's bottom right. that's one of my favorites the scarecrow from uh, the disney uh um, yeah that they they also made the Peter right. Cushing movie Night Creatures out of a great character. Well, we watched them. Um, I watched them growing up. First, uh, Secret Agent, and then uh, and then The Prisoner, Prisoner, mm -hmm. yeah. and then I guess Walt Disney is right well, it was right before that. But that I do remember that as being one of the scariest Walt Disney's. I, I oh, I remember one. being scared of the theme song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Now, that picture there is a that's great makeup. Yeah. I mean, he looks scary in that. <laughs> um, so lots of lots of everything from uh, I don't know. I'm not sure I've seen this one, the Moonshine War. <laughs> yeah, I don't see him playing a hillbilly, but you know, I'm sure he could pull it off. <laughs> he might be the federal agent. That's after him, but anyway, oh, maybe. Yeah. he's a he's a great actor, and he does great a good actor. job in here. Totally, he's pretty good. He's like the smart guy that knows what's going on until that one until that one point, and then he just kind of yeah starts flipping out. What's the most important thing to get the computer or to save Kim? You know, we gotta. Hmm. So you had a a piece on Cronenberg shots, like the guy, the artwork in the gallery. Yeah. yeah, just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a Cronenberg movie. Look at this folks. Uh, mm -hmm. why, why do those people look like the characters from that twilight zone episode? Who knows? Cause it's Cronenberg. Cause it's Cronenberg. Why is there a giant almost, head? Why not? They almost look like the guys in, uh, Oh, what was the Peter Jackson movie? First movie that we did. Oh, uh, uh, oh yeah. Bad taste. Yeah, bad taste. Yeah, bad, yeah. With the with the aliens, there. See, I would I if I'd been calling I mean, the shots here and I wasn't the guy who played the artist <laughs> down. You yes. know, in in this, he should have been the lead. They should have had him playing. Mm -hmm. He's in a lot of Cronenberg movies. I guess. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was good. So I really do think that Stephen Lack, and again, I don't want to pick on the guy, um, but I I really feel like that's the performance they wanted. And and it does make sense given who the character is and what he's gone through. I know that they like, tried to just, make him like a, a blank slate. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's it, a good choice, but it's not an interesting choice to watch. Right, right. But he, it was it was been, the delivery of lines was just horrible. That's yeah. the only thing yeah. I have about and, it. And it's especially horrible when you're in the same room, you're delivering those lines that way. To Patrick, Patrick freaking McGowan. Or, or Michael Ironside. There was a couple of lines Michael in there that I thought yeah. were just like, oh my God, it sounds like you're uh anyway. But but he kind of, you know, he, he kind of admitted he was kind of out of his element. Um that is a real problem though, when you have that. It always reminds me of one of my favorite, it's not a great show, great episode, but the Star Trek episode with the two aliens that are half black on one side and half white on the other. Frank Gorshin, yeah. yeah. yeah one yeah, of them's yeah, Frank yeah. Gorshwin, and the other one, unfortunately, is not. And these right. two characters were supposed to be, you know, that they're, I don't know if we're rooting for one or the other, but mm -hmm. Frank Gorshwin's actually the bad guy. And, but well, he's it's so like a, it's a better than yeah, the other it's, one. It's a race war. war. It's yeah. a race war where, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of, making a statement about racism, you know, black yeah. versus white. And these two people, they look the same to us, but the right. blacks on opposite no, sides. No, it was great sides. Star Trek was stuff. But, but the problem is the performances are so asymmetric, let's yeah. say, that it doesn't really work the way it should. And I felt I felt the same way here. You know, I know I'm not it's rooting for like, Revic. He's a bad guy, but I love him. When they revealed that they were brothers, I was like, what? 
Uh, they're brothers? <laughs> what, yeah. So how did you get so much personality? Yeah. And, uh, this guy was holding the door for you, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, let's see. Did we get through the Cronenberg weirdness? I think so. That was all that yeah. stuff in the bottom was that that artist studio was crazy. Mm-hmm. Looks, like inside a, looks like a head. panel from the Batman comics from the theater. Yeah, right. <laughs> Inside the head was awesome. Oh yeah, the little the little room. Yeah, they went inside yeah, there, and there was like weird pink veins and running through it, and cushions, and it just it was weird. All right, so the thing that everybody comes for, yeah, the headshot, shaboom. It's actually hard to get a good decent picture of this. Um, there's some animated. Uh, gifs or gifs out there but i thought maybe nobody was going to want to watch that over and over and over and over again while we're talking but uh, well i I frame it against it because i wanted to see yeah i could see anything uh like an apple core come out or something i'm sorry i it's freaking it looks realistic as hell to me without knowing what's going on i mean there's a point where where it's starting to explode and you're seeing like the teeth yeah you know coming kind of showing up in the side or something it's just they do a great it's job it's so crazy. wet when it plops over yeah right, so now, right for those who don't know they tried a bunch of different ways now i i can relate to this because i it, for a movie that we did blood of the mummy a head was supposed to be smashed and our original idea was the mummy was going to crush the head like this and so i i made a, a cast i made a gelatin head i put a plaster skull inside I filled it with all kinds of gushy stuff. And the problem is when you do all that, you've basically made a head. And the truth is, our the guy who played our mummy was strong, but he wasn't strong enough to actually crush an actual head. And when he tried, it just sort of, it broke the plaster and it uh, dented it a bit and some blood shot out of the eyes, but it was not the big effect we wanted. Mm. Um, that is that is a problem doing this. And every time they tried to do something, they shot air through it. It looked awful, blew up like a balloon. They they used pyrotechnics and there was smoke and fire. And that's not what this is supposed to be. So they finally came up with the genius idea. Don't do this at home either, kids. Um, they, they got their head, gelatin, skin plaster skull they put shrimp and gelatin and all kinds of brain stuff inside and then they shot it from behind with a double barreled shotgun filled with uh kosher salt and that's what you get <laughs> they, and they made everyone leave the room the cameras were running nobody else was in the room because this is are you sure they really made dangerous. everybody leave the room or they all said we're not sitting here while you yeah. fire off a shot no 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 <laughs> well, he made them leave the room yeah uh, Once you bring real guns into the equation, you're you're into a whole potential level of trouble that you can only imagine. Well, you know, they, they shot. They, no, they, right. they shot this at Concordia, where my daughter went to school oh, in Canada. Oh. Uh, but then they had to switch to this close up here in a warehouse because if they did this in the lecture hall of Can- right, Concordia, right. they would still be picking out pieces mm. to this day. Well, it works wonderfully. It's great, it's beautiful. Um, you know. If they'd have done it any other way, it wouldn't have been this awesome or as memorable, I don't think. No. Yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of information about uh, from, uh, is it Stephen Dupuy and Chris Wallace talking about how they got this to work on the crew. Um, and that uh, first they tried using pneumatic discharge, but it just looked too much like a ballooning head. Yeah, uh, and they tried all the stuff. stuff. Then they did a wax one that looked exactly like a wax head exploding. <laughs> yep. But then Wallace talks about packing it with uh, various materials, sealing it with wax, and uh, using uh, excess stuff from the lab like latex scraps and stray wax and gelatin brains and mm-hmm. corn syrup blood, leftover burgers from the. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a box so, uh, in my room somewhere that is basically, I just call them chunkies. And there are any uh, little bits of leftover latex or things from the end of a shoot that would just be thrown out. Nah, I just throw them into a box and one day, one day I'm going to do this, but it's going to be in the woods. It's not going to, you know, because yeah, this would, this would make me real. Guns make me nervous uh, on sets. 
I see a brand uh, formation formating here. Uh, call it Chunkies. 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 Sounds like a cereal. Okay, so I. I oh, that I would be this. great. Wouldn't that be a great cover of a cereal box right there? Ooh. Yeah, Chunk. Oh, Chunkies. They bleed in your mouth. Yeah. They turn your milk red. Turn your milk red. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like uh, what was the what was the cereal in Cujo? Nothing wrong here. Oh, that's right. The one that made people were red. vomiting <laughs> the red dye. Anyway, um, the uh, Michael Ironside said they were going to do it like in a plexiglass thing, but then the stuff would ricochet off. It would so, just bounce off. It would be right. It so so obvious, he yeah. offered to he offered to sit there, but said, "I want this amount of money, and I want this size of an insurance policy." Which Oof. they then went. Now, yeah. more than likely, he said all that stuff as a joke. I would guess. Uh, but yeah, because uh, this stuff hitting you at the speed that is probably coming out of this head. He should have been more splattered in blood than he was. You know, right. Like, he really wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, they made a good then, choice. Just, but they, they, the only well, thing that wasn't realistic is the hands don't move. Yeah. I, I got to believe there'd have been some kind of reflex action, but otherwise, I, I mean, I totally understand that. That's still yeah. awesome. I just, just, but the hands were amazingly realistic, you know, like frame advancing that mm -hmm. I'm telling you, they look like real hands sitting there mm -hmm. uh, instead of sculpted. Well, going back to rock salt. I have been shot with rock salt Ooh. in my misspent youth. I was so, going to say mom, mom again, or are you running from, an apple uh, pie from yeah. someone's uh, window. Yeah. Well, I, I won't go into the story. I might oh, okay. still be incriminating myself. If I go into it now. Wow. But uh, yeah, it's uh, mighty stingy. Yeah, I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll say bet. that at the least. Yeah. So we work our way through this film until we get to the final battle, where uh, after McGowan's dead and Lawrence Dane is dead and. Uh, Jennifer Neal's not dead, but she's uh, knocked out or asleep, drugged in another room. And Revick is telling Cameron how, what a great team they're going to make and take over the world from those weasley ass normals. I forget exactly what phrase he uses, but. By the way, wow. is where he should have just said, you're right, brother. That's a great idea. Let's sleep on it and then smother him with a pillow while he's yeah. sleeping. But no, no, no. He's going to take on the psychic psycho. Yes. Yes. Um, bring the normals to their knees. That was the phrase he used. Yeah. <laughs> Those are great shots there. And that, you know, they're. Now, I think. Those horrible uh, contacts yeah. that cover your entire flipping mm -hmm. eye. Oh, and and uh, Cameron and Stephen Lack's eyes like pop yeah. Blow inward out, or something. It's, oh my god! When then, I when I first saw that in the theater, I was like, "No, he's the hero! You can't do it." I know. I, I felt yeah. the same way. Yeah, when he's even when he's clawing his face and everything, it's like, yeah. "Geez, I I think he's gonna win." But what kind of victory is this? He's mm -hmm. he's really effed up here. And then his well, eyes when, blow out. You're like, well, gosh. When uh, Jennifer O'Neill's character walks in then and finds this twisted, burnt mm. cadaver-like thing on the floor, I, you can't tell who it is. Right. I mean, I, I wasn't really sure until we see the uh, Revit character in the corner. With his new eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I did want books. to mention... Uh, Lawrence Dane, because I just watched a movie he was in, a uh, 70s flick called The Rituals oh. with uh, Hal Holbrook. You ever seen yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, he's, but it's, it's one of those, he's the, he's the weaseliest guy. He just won't stop. He just won't shut up in that movie. Uh, about these five guys, that, doctors that go off into the wilderness for uh, their annual trip that somebody picks uh, and i believe they're in uh they're in the canadian wilderness I'm, i can't remember which province they're in but i'll bet anyway. that goes well for them yeah not not so much uh but it's interesting at any rate it's kind of a it's kind of a I kind of feel like it was maybe a takeoff of uh, Deliverance only. Mm -hmm. 
uh, with you know, Canadians. a few years later, yeah. kind of over the top, though. With What's Canadians. that? No pig. There was no pig or squealing or anything. But, uh, so anyway, um, what do we have left here? Now, that shot on the bottom, I guess, was one of the original things they were going to do. But again, it it's too pyrotechnic-y. Right, you know, right. And, and the scanners are just really kind of blowing up things. It's a cool pick. Boy, they better have you paid Ironside it. more than five thousand dollars for just yeah. for putting those damn things in his eye mm -hmm. and having all that makeup and everything on him. And uh, this, this is this. These shots here are worth more than that. Those well, contacts they started, hurt. Oh, they're the worst. Oh yeah, that's. They started off. I think they started off by talking. Um, talking with uh, God, who was who was the lead? effects guy on this to start with they started out by talking with dick smith like they went and met with him and he gave him advice and pointers and stuff yeah he was great for that do some certain things but at some point they brought him to toronto and he was actually there working with them on these little thin membranes to make the the uh uh the veins and stuff yeah. like on revix head there on the top which is and they look so good too and this is you know it's always impressive when you see an early use of some technology or idea and it still works it, yeah there's... well and it actually adds to it i somewhere i heard him read there's a couple spots where there's i think it's on uh cameron Vale, but there's uh little little uh uh spurts of blood that come yeah. out of them mm -hmm. and they actually said they couldn't get them to work so they had to poke holes in them so that it would yeah otherwise it was back pressuring you know, they were trying to push stuff in the blood into it. And uh, those mm -hmm. holes then provided room for them to bleed out like that, which really did add right uh, quite a bit to it. That was That's, one of the cool things about Dick Smith. I've heard, the stories I've heard is a lot of special effects artists won't give their secrets away. Oh, yeah. And they won't. But Dick Smith would tell anybody anything, you know, he, you know. Yeah. Dick Smith, Dick Smith. Any, anyone who's in makeup and special effects, I think, should use him as their template for how to be. Because mm -hmm. I think part of it was he knew that monster kids were going to do this. Let's make sure they're doing it safely. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they are going to be attaching firecrackers to blood squibs and, and hurting themselves or drinking poison, fake blood, um, or just using ketchup, which might be worse. So, he yeah, he just gave stuff out. And you know what it is? He was the best at what he did. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and just because I know the same recipe as what Dick Smith used, you'd still be way better off hiring Dick Smith because you're going to get the actual man using his techniques. So he was so confident in his abilities, I think, that he had no fear about giving away his secrets because the secret to being Dick Smith was being Dick Smith. Right. Everything right. else was and just I, formula. I've actually run into that in uh, professional life where where guys had a process or a system that they followed and they didn't want anybody to know what it was, you know, cause that yeah, right. kept them job security or something. Uh, but in reality, it, that stuff isn't that easy to repeat. You know, you can tell them yeah. exactly what to do and how to do it. And it's unless uh, it, it's not repeatable that often is, is that good? Well, it's like, it's like um, Ray Harryhausen really tried to keep a lot of the secrets of uh Dynorama or Dynamotion and everything. Uh, but the, but the truth is, and it's pretty obvious, uh, there weren't any really big, big secrets in how he did his stuff. But anyone else who's tried it, with like almost no exceptions, Jim Danforth and you know a couple others, David Allen, could never give you what Ray Harryhausen had. His real skill was not his little tricks and everything. His real skill was having the ability to keep all that in his head and give these little bits of puppets personality. Mm -hmm. But Dick Smith's wonderful, and his makeup stuff is still good to this day. His uh, his blood is fantastic. It's hard to find some of the ingredients now, um, but the things he did, just fantastic. And he and to the very end, he was always coming up with new stuff. Look, Dick Smith was so great that he took a young guy and made him look old in The Exorcist. And um, fifty years later, when the guy actually got as old as he was as that character, he looked just like the character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's, 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 right. <laughs> that's skill right there. Well, that was right out of uh, uh, Little Big Man, too. I think You're right. right about that same mm -hmm. time. So that's right. Um, which was a great. Uh, it's weird too because I effect. see a lot of old age makeup nowadays, and it looks awful. 
It's yeah. terrible. And you realize, well, that is one of those things that Smith was good at. And a lot of well, other otherwise good makeup people are. Unfortunately, people probably learned the right way and then figured out uh, cheaper shortcuts that don't look as good, but they're cheaper. Yeah. It's the only thing I can figure out that a lot of that stuff. Um, there's a couple shots in here I thought were kind of cool. One was the uh, when Cameron was doing battle with the computer system. I love those shots of the like the low level flyovers of the circuit boards. Yeah, just, at first I didn't know cool. what the hell that was. I, I know. Oh, whoa, those are capacity. It's on another planet or something. Or, it, or even the very simple one of holding the receiver in his hand and it's melting. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That was, that was uh, so cool. Well, then, and then just a, a couple of things I made notes about. One was when they're interviewing Revic, with the younger Revic with the with the third eye on his head. Uh, he says something about, um, you know, what about the voices? Whose voices were they? It was the other voices, the ones without lips, which I thought was a great way of stating it. It's just, it's, I don't know, it's creepy. You know, yeah. the voices without lips. Anyway, um, I like the scene where, you know, the, the building starts burning up, you know, when they come to get the the underground scanners. Yeah. There's there's some detail in here that I just think is, you know, it, it isn't, when you go, they have the shot from the ground looking up the building and there's smoke billowing out the windows. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not like, uh, I guess you wouldn't CGI smoke back in them, but it looked real to me. It just mm -hmm. looked real. And that crash when that van slash yeah. bus crashes into the the record store, that was that I thought was great too. And then the the bad guy comes in looking for him. And I just in terms of attention to detail, his coat was all splattered with rain because it was raining out, mm -hmm. which I thought was a nice touch. There's a lot of times where you would get over the course you know, in some of ways, I think multiple the, the, scenes, the guy's not wet anymore. You know, it's yeah. The the low budget sometimes helps in these things, and that you know, the scene where they're driving and all of a sudden the van pulls up next to him and starts shooting at them. It's oh, not super so yeah, yeah, it's not super fancy or anything, but it looks real. It works better than the way it would be done nowadays. Here's old man yells at clouds. Nowadays it would be like a Michael Bay scene. We'd have multiple edits, it'd be hard to tell what the hell's going on. And cars would be defying <laughs> gravity, and uh, I like this. There would have been, there would have been a, a perfect ramp right in the middle of the street, right? Exactly into as, the as air, the... into the store. Uh, We've gotten yeah, so like far away from doing like real stunts with real vehicles yeah. and stuff like that. Every can, everything can be done by computer now. And... Yeah. Well, you can. I mean, you can look at the just what you were saying. A shot of that van, the windows open. All you're seeing is that van. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not going to cost a lot. They don't have to be driving down the road or anything, you know. There's and, somebody outside shaking the... Yeah, <laughs> and, then, shaking they, the and then they... Then you go to a camera inside the other van and show guys getting shot. There's never a... I don't think there was ever a place where they were both in the scene together, mm -hmm. except, I mean, shooting. When they were driving down the road, they were. And that was cool, too, how that van just kind of comes out of nowhere down the sidewalk yeah. on the other side of the street. Mm -hmm. That was like it, like it materialized almost. That was... That was, I like that. All right. Uh, I don't know. We got any, uh, anything more we want to say about this other than. If you haven't seen this it, is, go uh, see it. If you haven't seen this, uh, please go see it because yeah. it's, it's a staple uh, sci fi horror uh, film. You know, um, it's, um, it almost, in a way, everybody remembers the head exploding scene, but there's so much more going on besides that and that was a sensational uh, uh scene it kind of sets up what you're dealing with and and um and uh and you that know kind the of power thing. right yeah yeah so you well aware of the danger that exists for the rest of the movie after that and um so yeah it i highly recommend this one of my favorite favorite movies one of my favorite oh, Cronenberg uh, movies yeah. yeah i've never seen that there are a couple of so-called sequels uh Scanners the new two, order and the new yeah. order and scanners yeah, three yeah. the takeover the take the takedown or something yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, and, and there's two spinoffs from that like i said earlier there's scanner cop and there's this scanner cop too but there's a different name for it but uh yeah they're terrible yeah yeah i mean 
like I said, this premise, the sequels practically write themselves, but unfortunately they didn't, and somebody else did and didn't do a great job. Well, um, and you kind of brought it up too, Bill. There's certain, I was really into these psychic, mental power, uh, science fiction novels. So I really liked uh, The Fury by John Ferris. So uh, really excited when that became a movie. And of course, you know, they're, <clears throat> you're, they're never quite like the book, but uh, De Palma puts his own stamp on it. Uh, and then Kings, the Dead Zone and Firestarter, I right. just captured my imagination, the books mm -hmm. and the, the movie, The Dead Zone, I thought was great. Right. And Carrie, of um, course. I mean, it's it's a uh, cool oh, yeah, premise. Yeah. It's a, it's just a cool premise that these people who often are have no power suddenly discover they have right. powers. And then there's many directions you can go with that basic premise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and it's easy to it's easy to suck into the idea because they're all, they were always running around saying you only use 10% of your brain, you know. Right. Yeah. Different different people. So uh anyway, yeah. Lots of good stuff. Any final comments? Are we this is this is when Cronenberg was really starting to get yeah get rolling on and you know oh, yeah. as, uh, to me uh, I, I like Rabbit and I like uh, the other films but this is I feel like this is where he was really starting to roll and, and get and get his groove on what he kind of movies he wanted to make and uh, I, I just love this movie. I think I read that he was, uh, or I saw an interview um, when this came out, and I forget who he was with. It was some Canadian show, and he said he he was, uh, you know, while he's publicizing that, he was working on the script for Videodrome. Mm. Um, so yeah, he does hit a string. I, you know, I love the '70s stuff too because it it shows so much. You, you can see the development, like just from. From shivers to uh, to uh, rabid to the brood, mm -hmm. is a huge he's, strides, he's such a I cerebral think. director, and it was it felt good at the time too. Horror was not really well thought of back then, and here's someone who's making movies that have the most you know grisly exploitive premises, but with a lot of intelligence. Even the critics who poo pooed horror and they most of them did back then had to admit that this guy was you know interesting yeah there a lot of it was i wonder why he makes these kind of films when clearly he has the talent to make real pictures that we would not be talking about right. today right well it, well in yeah, someone else's hit. hands they they would have been oh this would have been terrible b, b movie type uh you know low budget type movies but like you said the intelligence behind them and the ideas behind them sort of elevated that to the next level. And he was the master of this kind of body horror type of film. It's unfortunate that a lot of the people who own the rights to these various properties don't get that. So you have a Joe Dante who makes the howling and it's great. And then they make a whole bunch of howling movies without Joe Dante. Right. And they're terrible. <laughs> right. Each one worse than the last. Yeah. But he does, he does have that great string. And I, I, just to repeat yeah. that, he starts with shivers, rabid, and then the brood, and then scanners, videodrome, dead zone, the fly, and dead ringers all right in a row in the that's, 80s. That's that's an enviable run right there. Uh, and then gets away a little bit from it. I, I've liked some of his later ones. I haven't seen all of them to be honest with you. I like History yeah. of Violence. I liked Eastern Promises. Um, yeah, he he I, broke away from horror, and that's fine. He he's he's done his time in the trenches. Um, and everything and now he's you know history of violence was an incredible film right wasn't yeah. that based yeah. on a comic book yeah based graphic on a graphic novel. novel yeah yeah all right well that's it for scanners boy we got some uh we got us some feedback today letters we get letters uh let's start with uh god it's too bad crystal isn't here yeah um Maybe maybe I should save this one. Save that one for when she's back. I'll save for one for Crystal from uh, Lone Wolf on the movie Warlock. But we'll save that one. So next up is uh, 218 Cat's Eye. Uh, Bill, you want to take that from Nick sure. Gadman? from Nick Gadman. 
Great to see this underrated movie get some love. Cat's Eye was one of the few contemporary horror movies that we were allowed to watch as kids, as a lot of films that passed as PG in the U.S., Poltergeist, Gremlins, Monster Squad, were rated 15 in the U.K., which is the equivalent of an R rating, except no one under 15 is admitted allowed to rent even with an adult present. Wow. A lot of those movies had to be vetted by parents first, but this one, along with Creepshow, were deemed on the softer end of the spectrum <laughs> and got a lot of play at our house, as did the others I mentioned, except for Poltergeist. I will never understand how kids were allowed to watch that film. The early haunting scenes in Poltergeist still terrify me. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Cat's Eye is probably my introduction to James Woods, who I became a huge fan of in the 80s. Quitters Incorporated is one of the most original anthology stories put on screen, and that troll provided endless amusement being voiced by Frank Welker, who is probably featured in just about every cartoon we were watching at the time. <laughs> yeah. My only disappointment with this week's show was the lack of Chad Hunt. Yep. Hope things are working for you next time, buddy. I miss hearing your thoughts on this oft-overlooked gem. Well, thank you, Nick. You are the man. Love you. Thank you. You know, he he uh, it's interesting that he brings that in because the idea of the uh, uh, UK rating system, because we talked about that, I think, in a 70s episode about what was the, what made an X and Y did, you know, and what were the different ratings. And uh, holy cow, uh, both Nick yeah. and uh, a listener named Andy Morton posted several links on our Facebook group uh, to things that helped explain to me uh the different uh, the the uh the uh uh development the evolution of the british uh rating system um it's still pretty fuzzy yeah it's <laughs> odd. Well, and i should mention too nick nick is a well-known cat lover yeah which is yes, a sign is. of good personality and uh, yes good judgment on his part all right, to episode 219, Sleepaway Camp. Chad, this is a new commenter, I believe. Wow, okay. Hmm. Laz comments on Sleepaway Camp and says, I think Sleepaway Camp would be completely forgotten if it wasn't for that infamous final shot. I agree. The 80s slasher cycle is such a strange one because, in my opinion, many, not all, of the most iconic films are distinctly average, whilst lesser, lesser remembered fairs such as The House on Sorority Row, Happy Birthday to Me, The Initiation, and Hell Night are some of the very best, or at least my own personal favorites. We'll get to them. Yeah, we will. I, I agree. This is this was shocking at the time uh, with that final that final scene and that final revelation at the end. So. Um, but it didn't really have too much going for it otherwise, except for the the uh, hilarious uh, <laughs> camp counselors and the way they dressed and that kind of thing. Right. But, well, uh, but uh, yeah. Well, and I was what I was thinking as we were reading that was uh, it's it's the final scene, but they took the setup of the crazy aunt who forces yeah him to grow up as a girl yeah um which is different um which adds something to it but you don't know it until that final scene and then you're just like holy crap right uh so bill we got another one on sleepaway camp from i think this is somebody you know this is someone i know renee saint Aubin, who i do other podcasts with as well and is a fantastic person if you watch carefully ronnie's shorts get shorter with every kill dun 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 <laughs> Yikes! It's a good thing there wasn't a massacre. There'd be it's nothing true. left. It's yeah. true. It's, it's, it's yeah. It's good he died before the final. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, <laughs> all right, uh, Chad. Here we go. Uh, well, a couple of them, but the first one uh, I'll take on episode two twenty. Akira from Mister Deer, just two blue heart emojis. Love, love. So uh, <laughs> I hope you listen to the podcast. But even if you're just commenting on the movie, yeah, we agree with you. Yeah. Uh, and then one from Lone Wolf on Akira. Chad? Sure. Lone Wolf says, Akira wasn't just a milestone for anime, but a major milestone for pop culture itself. I don't think Final Fantasy VII would be as popular as it is today if it wasn't for this 80s anime masterpiece. Akira wasn't my first venture into the genre, 
I saw Demon City, Shinjuku, and Princess Mononoke first. Demon City's awesome. But when I saw Akira, I was super impressed with the visuals and the music. It really does have that Blade Runner noir feel to it with characters that are set up for ultimate failure in this apocalyptic world. Tetsuo's development from loser to God is compelling. And in the end, he pretty much gets what he wished for, but at a great cost. Absolute power corrupts absolutely is the name of the game. And you'd have a pretty hard time finding an anime story that plays it better than Akira. Totally agree with you. It's just a, it's, it's just a milestone. Uh, and it gets poo-pooed on a lot because people like to be snobs about anime and go, well, this is this, and I like this better. Than she, and, and Akira is not. Akira was a milestone in animation, as, as far as I'm concerned, and not only just in animation, but um, in movies in general. Uh, it's it's just a fantastic movie, despite what genre it seems to fall in. Yeah, I, you guys, you got me yeah. converted. Uh, and then one from Jerry Chandler, Bill, if you could take. Yeah, that and one. Jerry brings an interesting perspective to this. Um, Jerry says, I saw this in a specialty theater in Williamsburg and was doing a limited release in the U.S. It was kind of revolutionary for its time, but it was also a little lacking. By the time this dropped, Marvel's Epic line had released about 30 or so pretty hefty-sized issues of the story. Like the Star Blazers live-action movie from a few years ago, I don't think this is ever going to be a fully satisfying viewing experience for me. It's an amazing Cliff Notes version of the story I knew before seeing it, but having been following the release of the manga through Epic, it felt like looking forward to an extravagant meal at a high-end restaurant and ending up at Hardee's. But damn, Ooh. I was at the end of my teens when this hit the theaters here in the States, and I remember what a big deal it was for many. I think the hype helped open doors for later releases of better Japanese animated films. And of course, we will always owe this manga and movie a great debt for giving us the climax to Trapper Keeper of uh, the Trapper Keeper episode of <laughs> South Park. Yeah, true. P.S. Jeff needs Star Blazers in his life. Well, don't we all? Yeah, he does. Do we? Do I? Yeah. I remember. I, I, the thing with me is, I saw the movie first. Right. I think and that I, really yeah. colors things yeah. very different. And that, so well, it made it made it different for me. And I didn't read the comics until the I mean that was like later. I saw Dune. I saw the movie, the original Dune version, before I ever read the books. And I'm with a whole uh, crowd of people who were just like, they were so right. angry that right. they left this out and they left that out. I'm like, you shut can't. up. I'm having a good time here. Well, well the, the manga it, it went into detail in yeah. a lot of different ways and, and shot into a lot of different areas. So you almost have to look at these two as yeah, different sides of, uh, of the same thing. Uh, of course, of course, uh, you get all the detail and everything with the comic itself. Um, a lot of those characters that you see for like one or two seconds on right on on film were major or big characters in the story. That's the what comic. hurts a lot of people when you watch even like the Harry Potter stuff and everything. Characters that are really cool char might be your favorite character in the book. They show up in the movie and it's basically a cameo. Yeah, and that bugs well, you I, more than if they weren't there at all. I think every so I, every book is like that. I had to, at some point, I had to come to a realization that that's a book. This is a movie. Yeah, I'm going to go see a movie yeah. that says it's based on the book. Let's see what happens. You know, because not because to me, Dune no. was one that I Dune's one of my all time favorite books. But I mm -hmm. the the latest Dune I liked a lot, but it's been a long time since I read the book. Yeah, uh, but it but it had the feel that I remember to it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chad. That's no, I was I was just going to say to me, not one's not better than the other one. They're both they're both um, like I said, milestones. And in, in, uh, I mean, that is a long uh, story that you have to get into. Yeah, and and hope you don't forget things that happened 30 issues ago. Oh, <laughs> you know, and that and that kind of thing. Well, so they, I, but it's I'm not saying it, one is not right. better than the other. They're both their own entities, you know. But it, but if you go into a, a movie uh, based on a book or even on a manga that runs for years, then expecting with expectations, you're just shooting yourself in the foot because there's no way they can put it on right. the movie. It's sure. just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's a tough but I can see where Jerry's coming from. Oh, right I now. totally it, do. It's yeah. it's uh yeah. So 
I, I pulled this off of Facebook. We had a couple of conversations going. So Scott Wells commented on Akira uh, when the episode came out, said something to listen to on my drive home. I rewatched it last week in preparation. Forgot how much I love the soundtrack. Yeah, the, the music then, is just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Our good friend awesome. Kayla Nan replied, I literally just did all the operatic music in my head and out loud and scared the shit out of all my dogs. <laughs> Laugh out. Yeah. Uh, I love worship and adore this movie. I listen to a lot of anime soundtracks. Princess Mononoke's is not only my daughter's and my favorite movie, but the soundtrack is beautiful. Also, Vampire Princess Miyu has yes. a nice one. Yeah, uh, Ghost in the uh, Shell then, is one of my favorite soundtracks. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, they had a nice conversation going. Then Scott Wells replies, I've heard the Miu one. is It's one of my favorites from that era. I will also throw out uh, the sound, throw out there the soundtracks to Silent Mobius, Noir, and Revolutionary Girl, Utina. Hmm. So, I, it's a lot. I, you, I'm getting a lot of a list of stuff here to look at. Um. Michael Zatt says Gigantor of the early 60s and Speed Racer are the only anime that I watched. I never got into that media, although your podcast has piqued my interest. Great podcast. Love you guys. Hope you had a terrific turkey day. Uh, We did. And then Kayla replies to him. If you're ever interested in strange anime or downright amazing anime, this group has a few lurking lovers of it, as we just found out. I guess so. So... Awesome. I appreciate it. All of you, Kaya, love to hear from you. Yes. Yes, all uh, of you. Thank you. Kayla. I'm sorry. I said Kaya. I'm thinking anime or something. <laughs> uh, and a couple of new commenters, Mr. Deer and Laz. Yeah. Thanks, uh, guys. Yeah. Great to hear from Lone Wolf and Nick Gadman again. And Renee, thank you so much. And, um, of course, Jerry. And Jerry. 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 Appreciate it, Jerry. All right. That's it for this episode, but every two weeks we'll be focusing on a specific film released between 1980 and 1989. Next up is one chosen by Bill. Yes. Um, it's it's maybe a little more fantasy than horror, but it's got a <laughs> great monster and okay. some pretty horrible things happen. It's and what is it? Dragon Slayer. <laughs> I feel like, like three or four months ago we decided... Ah, we're not going to worry about doing straight horror, and boom, we're doing Dragon Slayer and Clash of the Titans. And it's got a month. Uh, it's got a Akira dinosaur that eats. I'm people. not. I'm not arguing Come with on. you. I just. I, yeah. It's just, uh, you can only have so many it. guys I've hacking never up campers. Seen this. You've I've never seen, seen Dragon Slayer? Nope. Get nope. ready. I'm not, for a, I'm not a big uh, fantasy dragon. Well, okay, this is one of the dirtiest, grittiest fantasies okay. out there, which I really like, and also. You are going to plots when you see how good this dragon is, especially, you know, for the technology at the time, Mm -hmm. pre-CGI, an amazing, amazing dragon. Very Uh, influential, I think, on what came afterwards. Yeah. Um, I'll look forward to that. Uh, Before we go, Scanners, as of today, November 30th, is on HBO Max, Criterion Channel, and IndiePlex in terms of uh, subscription. Um, and then there's some pay-per-view options as well. Uh, and I think, uh, what did we say? Uh, Dragon Slayer is right now available on Paramount Plus Canopy, which is the greatest deal going. If you have a library card, you could get into Canopy and you can watch six movies a month for free. Uh, no commercials. That's what a deal. A pretty dang good service. And Pluto TV. So, uh, y'all, if you want to check that out before we get to it, I'm sure all this stuff will be gone in the two weeks between yeah. now and when this comes out. Right. December 1st is tomorrow, so everything will change. Yeah. Uh, plenty of ways to stay in touch. Please like, subscribe, share, leave feedback. We love feedback, um, as you can tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we love hearing from our, the most knowledgeable fans, I think, uh, in the genre. Uh, so, so do that. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah. Cause I got to pee. All right. <laughs> well then. Wow. In that case. <laughs> On that note. Um, There's no, um, I have to pee. 
Catch us again. Yeah, stop bombing. Catch us again here in two weeks for another great horror movie of the 1980s, as only decades of horror can do it. Thank you, guys, and say good night. Thank you, and good night. night. Gruesome Magazine.